lecture 41 okay and uh, we were looking at the last thing we were doing was looking at uh, OFDM in the presence of ISI and we were looking at a discrete time model and uh, this is how this is how the model looked okay so my the overall system is going to have uh, symbols coming in okay so I'll call it SK then the first thing you do is a serial to parallel conversion Okay, so you have S of 0 all the way to S n minus 1. And then you do what? Then you do an what's the next step? IFFT, right? So it's you do an IFFT and an endpoint IFFT, and this gives you a set of intermediate symbols. Okay, I, call, I think I called it x tilde, okay, x tilde 0 to x tilde n minus 1. Okay, and okay, so in order to deal with ISI, we came up with this uh, suboptimal idea of converting, doing what? Converting linear convolution to circular convolution on a block like I said it's a suboptimal idea but it works okay so you repeat from n minus l plus 1 all the way to x tilde n minus 1 after that you do the same transmission as before okay so once you do that you all you have, all you do next is a parallel to serial conversion and then you transfer okay so this goes out and uh, the total number of complex numbers that you'll be sending out will be n plus what l minus 1 okay so that's what you'll be sending out okay i don't want to call them symbols i'll say complex numbers okay so 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 this will go through a d2a converter right with the sync interpolation at at a rate of t by n okay and then you send it out up convert and then send it and then you down convert and then you do a anti-aliasing filter followed by a sampler then you'll get a sequence of symbols corresponding to each transmitted symbol okay so all that we are modeling as a filter hk okay so i might have done everything with n did i do everything with n okay so let me do Okay, so you have HN and then noise getting added. Okay, so the point of adding the cyclic prefix was to make sure that this linear convolution with HN becomes a circular convolution on a subset of the numbers that you are sending out. Okay, so you do a uh, on the received values here, you do a serial to parallel conversion okay you will get received values corresponding to the cyclic prefix which you ignore and then the received values corresponding to the actual transmitted uh, numbers that I am going to call y tilde 0 so on down to y tilde n minus 1 okay and uh, and I said I am going to write the vector of y tilde 0 to y tilde n minus 1 as a matrix times the vector x tilde 0 to x tilde n minus 1 okay and i said this this channel is this l taps h of 0 to h of l minus 1 okay so if you start writing out that 
can you can do that very carefully see y tilde 0 maybe i'll show y tilde 1 n minus 1 it's going to be equal to what will be the size of this matrix n by n right so it's got x tilde 0 x tilde 1 Okay, so the first row is going to be what? Okay, so the first row is going to be a convolution output at this point, right? So this is where you have to see. Okay, so the convolution output at that point is the first row. So h of 0 multiplies x of 0, then h of 1 multiplies what? x tilde n minus 1, then h of 2 multiplies so on till h of l minus 1 which multiplies x tilde of n minus l plus 1 okay so that's the remaining entries will be 0 okay so what about the next row it will be a cyclically shifted version okay so you can show that it will be this think about it and carefully make sure that you can understand that 0 h of l minus 1 this thing will be h of 2 okay it just comes from the simple linear convolution formula but since we repeated the values once again even the first thing becomes a circular convolution if 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 we did not repeat it what will be the first row it will simply be h of 0 followed by all zeros since i repeated it the other entries also enter the picture okay so to complete this all you have to do is just repeatedly do this n times if you do it n times this row is going to end at l minus 1 right afterwards you will have 0 okay so the last row to figure out the last row you can take the first row and do what rotate shift left okay so that's an easy way of figuring out what the uh, last row has to be so that will work out as h of l minus 1 all the way down to h of 0 Okay, so the last, uh, this guy will be some h of l minus 1 here followed by 0. Okay, so there will be a h of 0 line coming through also. Okay, so you can check all. Okay, so uh, so this is the this is the matrix representation of this. And this becomes a circular matrix, circulant matrix with the first column being the channel tabs okay so what's the next column next column is a cyclic downshift of the first column likewise that's another way of viewing this matrix these are all also a uh, version of toplitz matrices this, these, these things have these matrices have very nice properties okay which you use quite often okay so now there are several ways of describing F fft the fft matrix and a circle and matrix are very closely related okay so what's the relationship yeah, so if you the, the, the every column of the FFT matrix is an eigenvector of this uh, circle and matrix. What's the eigenvalue? It's the value of the Fourier FFT at that, that point. Okay, so that's the relationship. But uh, let me show you how that works out. So I, I'll not I'm not going to prove that relationship here. I, I'm assuming you know that. I'm going to simply write down what the answer is. Okay, so it turns out the circle and matrix. can be written as let me be careful here so i need the right uh, kind of expression f of t n inverse times a diagonal matrix times f of t n of yeah, this is the way in which you can write the circle and matrix okay so what goes on the diagonal is capital H of 0, capital H of 1, all the way down to capital H of n minus 1. And what's capital H of k? Is I think uh, summation, there'll be a, there might be a 1 by root n, k. Uh, n equals 0 to n minus 1, H of n, e power minus j, 2 pi, and k by 
okay so this is a very standard result which you have used all the time in FFT right circular convolution of two sequences becomes the product of the pointwise product of the FFTs okay so it's the same result read in another another way okay so now going back to our uh, so this this is all zero going back to the previous equation the vector y tilde 0 to y tilde n minus 1 becomes what okay becomes f of t inverse times this matrix times f of t n x okay so i'm going to pull the f of t inverse to this side okay so you get f t n times this equals a diagonal matrix h of 0 h of 1 h of n minus 1 0 here 0 here times what f of t times x tilde what is f of t times x tilde the vector of s okay remember how did we get x x was the if f of t inverse of s so if you multiply that out you will simply get the vector of s s 0 to s n minus 1 okay so 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 this equation suggests an obvious way of processing the the vector y okay the y vector should be done what should you do to it in this picture what should i do to this y i should take fft okay if i take fft at the output i can expect each entry to be a scaled version of the symbol scaled by some complex number okay so it's like a one tap channel for each symbol each symbol went through a one tap channel and you do a simple one tap equalizer for each subcarrier separately followed by a slicers independently you can decode uh, the symbols okay so that's the that's the story at the receiver so at the receiver Okay, you have y tilde 0, y tilde n minus 1, which goes through a f of t n, and then you do one tap equalizer. to get your uh, then your slice get your s hat of 0 to s hat of n minus 1 yeah it's, it's all complex no so yeah that is the one tap equation that's the definition of a one tap equalizer. <laughs> the one tap equalizer will basically find the scaling. If you train it, so even the AGC, for instance, right, the automatic gain control that you might want to do can be pulled into the one tap equalizer. So it's enough if you do that. As long as you have a training phase, you can determine the scaling. It's really easy to do that. Okay, so this is a very simple equalizer. Okay, so I wrote it down as if this is an optimal way of processing and dealing with ISIO. Clearly, it's not optimal. Okay, so it's far away from being optimal, and this is a major overkill. But look at the huge advantage for the receiver. Okay, receiver doesn't change at all. Okay, and only thing you have to do is an FFT, which is which has been researched so deeply that people have very very efficient implementations of FFT in uh, in digital. Okay, so it's very easy to get nice uh, what are called IP cores for doing these FFTs. It's very easy to get that and then very low power implementations are available. So once you do that, beyond that, it's a simple one tap equalizer. There's nothing. In fact, even the tap, usually you don't train. There's some pilot, some pilot assisted uh, thing available for which the tap is pretty much given to you. Okay, so you know what that is and all you have to do is slice on each uh, subcarrier. And on top of that, it gives you so much flexibility at the transmitter you can put different type of alphabets on different subcarriers depending on the strength of the tap 
okay if the, if you see that the snr on on one subcarrier is higher then you maybe do a larger constellation so you can you give you get all that flexibility at the transmitter the flexibility of working with a set of parallel channels okay so that that's a huge advantage and because of that ofdm is really really popular today both in wireless applications and even in wireline applications like dsl ofdm is very very popular gives a uh, lot of uh, good performance and people have studied capacity closely and you can even show that it approaches capacity also when if n is very large the penalty you pay in terms of the cyclic prefix will become negligible okay so if n is large then it's okay if n is small then you are paying two penalties okay one is the decrease decrease in the data rate okay the data rate overall decreases by a fraction n by n plus l approximately okay right you not every symbol you are transmitting carries data in fact the cyclic prefix is not used at all at the receiver you just throw it out okay so only a, a smaller fraction is there so that's one penalty and on another penalty you pay is you have to actually transmit those symbols okay so that again consumes power at the transmitter okay so you pay double penalty but in spite of that this is very popular because of the simplicity of the receiver okay so this kind of equalization is also called frequency domain equalization okay so instead of dealing with isi in the time domain by building filters maybe to minimize mean square error etc in the time domain completely you kind of move comfortably to a frequency domain where to the frequency domain where the equalizer becomes one tap for instance if you choose the numbers carefully okay but one more thing i have to point out is uh, the cyclic prefix while you while while it's totally lost from a data recovery point of view can be used for symbol timing recovery and all that because it's the same repetitive pattern which shows up at the interval of at a certain interval okay so you know the same pattern will appear again so you can look for that and then figure out some timing information from that so that's done sometimes okay so that's useful so the cyclic prefix has some added benefit in a implementation sense okay however there's one practical problem because of the ofdm uh, symbols okay so you're so that a final transmitted si signal after you do the d2a and in complex base band right when and then uh, so the disk analog signal is going to actually be a sum of several sinusoids okay so when you take sum of several sinusoids what ends up happening is this uh, what's called the peak to average ratio becomes very large okay so one way of thinking about it is the sum of several sinusoids will typically tend to a kind of a gaussian distribution for values okay so you can show these things it's possible to show the different amplitudes and phases if you add a whole bunch of sinusoids it it will tend towards a gaussian distribution when you take samples okay so on these gaussian distributions if you take a whole bunch of values and look at the maximum value as opposed to the average the maximum value can be fairly large okay so it's possible to find all these things okay so the peak to average ratio is going to be large for this this x of t so what so what's the problem i'm sorry yeah so the problem will come at the power amplifier level the point is whenever you design whenever you compute your snr do you use peak power or average power use average power right so that's how we computed it so it was always expected value of x squared so it's always the expected value it's the average power and all the theory you do is for the average power okay but the power amplifier has to deal with the signal which goes all the way to the peak amplitude and hopefully doesn't <coughs> distort okay so you want a linear response for the peak amplitude and if your average to power peak per ratio if the peak to average ratio is very high then it puts extra strain on the power amplifier okay so these these things become more expensive so there are all kinds of techniques you'll see a lot of research trying to reduce what's called the papr for ofdm signals peak to average power ratio okay so that's that's one penalty you pay from a very practical implementation level but of, of obviously it can be overcome and it can be done it can be overcome in several ways in, in fact sometimes people tolerate non linear distortions in the power amplifier and compensate for it with a similar non linear processing at the receiver so that's also possible so you can do some uh, some such thing okay so so that's ofdm so in short ofdm is a block modulation scheme okay so instead of doing serial pam you do block modulation scheme and it gives you it's it's easy, easiest to understand it in the frequency domain okay so even though it's not fdm even though the subcarriers and the 
signals used for per subcarrier overlap in frequency okay it's easiest to understand it in the frequency domain it gives you rough separation in the frequency in the frequency domain okay it still overlaps but by clever baseband processing you can completely separate the signals even in the presence of isi by adding a suitable cyclic prefix so because of all these things OFDM is very very uh, popular okay any questions questions or comments about what this is okay so so if you take any of today's wireless standards okay or the future wireless standards they will all for sure use OFDM so there's no doubt about it OFDM both in the uplink and the version of it on uh, the downlink and the version of it in the uplink also so they use OFDM everywhere Okay, it gives a lot of uh, flexibility. Okay, so I think. Uh, Even in this case, the channel has notches. Hmm. Yeah. So what happens is when you do uh, when you allot. So 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 I've been talking about this flexibility of putting different kind of alphabets on different subcarriers. Okay. So usually in systems when you actually design it. You expect some feedback from the receiver to tell you these are my good sub good subcarriers, these are my bad subcarriers. So the bad subcarriers, you can show even from an information theoretic capacity maximization point of view that in the bad subcarriers you should not put anything. So you don't put anything in the bad subcarriers. So the, there'll be no data coming there. So you use only the power is best used that you have is best used in the subcarriers that are good. Okay, of course there are other constraints to look at it, look at, but usually that's how the power is allotted. Okay, so in fact, if you have a notch, you will allot zero power to that circuit. So that kind of flexibility you get with OFDM. If you are doing completely in time domain, adjusting your signal spectrum to look like that is not so easy. There are clever ways of doing it, but it requires too much of processing at the receiver. Here, this receiver doesn't do anything, it only does FFT. So that's the main advantage. Any other question? Okay, so I think that brings us to the end of OFDM and uh, I'm going to, so for the, I think the only thing that's left is to talk briefly about coding, okay. So what we'll see in the next few lectures is a brief introduction to error control coding as it's used in digital communication systems and we'll see some very simple examples and then we'll see convolutional codes as the main coding technique, okay. So I won't introduce anything else, only convolutional codes. So uh, uh, so, so I think we have roughly four or five lectures left. Maybe, maybe I'm over counting it a little bit. And uh, well, actually, there's more. And after that, after four or five lectures, I'm going to do tutorial uh, sessions. Okay. And yesterday there was an exam. And few people wrote it. But I think uh, so. Maybe I should put out solutions for problem seven. So in, in the problem set, problem set seven. There are two things for which you have to think a little bit. What are the two things? So I have asked you to formulate the equations for the zero forcing linear equalizer and the MMSE DFE. Okay. So I think most people who wrote the exam yesterday didn't formulate the equations for zero forcing linear equalizer. Did you or didn't? Uh, I think some people might have done it, but some people did do it. So it's, it's very easy. Zero forcing linear is very very easy, right? So it's you have to make sure that some things go to zero, right? So maybe maybe I'll put out a solutions uh, solutions for that sometime tomorrow or day after. Okay, so next week also we'll have an exam on the on problem set eight, but I think eight has very few problems, so maybe I'll add few more problems to it, and then there'll be then maybe there'll be one problem set on the OFDM OFDM things, and then one more in coding, and with that it'll be over. Okay, so we'll have a total of ten problem sets to deal with. Over. Okay, so let's uh, move towards coding. Okay, so but before that, so okay, so the first thing is about the terminology. Okay, so you always talk about error control codes, and the thinking is you design a, a digital communication system, and then if there are errors, the errors can be corrected by error control codes yeah of course that's a very good way of viewing error control codes not wrong that is also possible but today people have the not just today even traditionally the best way of understanding the role of error control codes in digital communication system is through what's called the notion of coding gain okay okay 
So, so far we have never talked about any signal processing technique which provides something called coding gain. Okay. So, what is coding gain? What is gain? Okay. So, so far we always did some processing. Okay. Whatever processing we did and then we saw the probability of error as a function of SNR. Okay. For that processing. Okay. And then we took whatever it gave. Right. So, maybe there was an optimal way of processing it. But ultimately we just took probability of error as a function of SNR as based on the analysis whatever it gave you okay so none of the techniques really give you a method to improve on that trade off okay how can i get the same a better probability of error at the same snr how can i get uh, what's the other other thing okay how can i get the same probability of error at a much lower snr okay so those are two things which are important trade offs if you remember in the very first class we talked about these trade offs in many in any communication system ultimately there will be one plot what will be that plot there will be some error rate here okay so maybe just to be specific i'll say some bit error rate versus what's called eb over n0 okay so that's what i've been talking about energy per information bit divided by noise okay so the energy you're spending per information bit or noise i mean power per information bit divided by noise okay so and, and then you make a plot Okay, so if you take for instance QAM or QPSK or BPSK, okay, it's a very good example. And then you make a plot here. This point will be around what? Say 10 dB when this is 10 power minus 6. Okay, so these are plots. Okay, and if you have ISI, then this plot might shift to the right or left or it might worsen. Usually it will shift only to the right or it will stay where it is. Okay, so that's what will happen. Okay, and uh, Okay, so the, so uh, I somehow uh, went into ISA. Maybe I'll come back and address the issue of ISA later. But for now, if you imagine there's no ISA or anything, the most interesting thing to look at in this curve is what? The question, most important and interesting question to ask with respect to this curve is how do I move this to the left? Okay, so far we have never seen a method to do that. And error control codes pretty much are the only method available today to move this curve to the left. Okay, so in that way, Coding should not just be thought of as correcting errors. It's a fundamental trade-off between EB over N0 and bit error. Okay, so in fact, in Shannon's first paper on theory of communication, he had codes and he showed what's the best trade-off is. Okay, so that's what the whole thing about capacity is. Okay, so codes form part and parcel of communication systems. And with, but the the side effect of that is the problem with that is it requires more complicated receiver processing. Of course, right? Without getting any gain itself, we saw equalization was fairly tough. Okay, so receiver processing is required. So if you are getting coding gain, then obviously processing will become difficult. So that's why it was not so popular for quite quite some time. Okay, but once with advanced implementation possibilities today, people of course obviously implement very complicated error control codes in today's communication systems. Okay, so once our study of digital communication is not really complete without looking at error control codes so for that purpose we'll quickly see it okay so if somebody asks you what the main purpose of error control codes is is to move this curve to the left provides you a method for moving this curve to the left okay so it turns out for instance for if you look at bpsk or something this curve can move all the way to very close to zero okay right so if you if you can come very close to zero. So gains of 8 dB and 9 dB are theoretically possible with error control codes. Okay, so 8 and 9 dB are huge numbers. Okay, billions of dollars. Okay, so maybe billions of dollars doesn't mean anything now, but but anyway, so that's a number to keep in mind. Okay, so 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 we'll we'll study this in uh, uh, with with for for very simple situations. Okay, so we won't study it in the most general way. The model that I will take for uh, for looking at uh, error control codes is the BPSK over AWGN model. Okay, I might briefly hint at other constellations. Okay, but mostly I'll be talking only about BPSK over AWGN. So how does this model look? So you make bits, no ISI. Okay, what do you do if there is ISI? Equalize. Yeah, equalize, and once you equalize. If you look at the input to the slicer, from your symbols to the input to the slicer, it's going to be roughly BPSK over AWG. If you're doing BPSK, 
with the SI also, right? So that's the logic behind just sticking to BPSK over AWGM. So all these other ugly signal processing techniques you use to get to the slicer, we will not look at right now. We've already seen it. You know how to do that. Okay. So since we've already seen it, we'll only look at this part for the coding game. Okay. So bits go through a mapper. Zero goes to plus one. One goes to minus one. Okay. And then you produce a symbol sequence. Okay. So the symbols are plus minus one. And then what 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 happens to the symbol sequence? Noise gets added to it. Remember, it's all discrete time model. Okay, so this noise will be normal distributed with zero mean and some variance sigma squared. Okay, and then you get a received value which you have to process. Okay, so so far we've been just talking about slicing the received value. Okay, so maybe soft slicing. Okay, so soft slicing or hard slicing. Hard slicing will mean at the output of the slicer you decide whether it is zero or one soft slicing will be you provide the LLR. Okay, so LLR in this case is very simple, right? So what's the LLR? If you have a received value R, the LLR will work out to two times R by sigma square. Okay, so it's as good as R. Okay, so so if your receiver works with R itself, it's said to do soft processing. Such receivers are called soft receivers. Okay, so if it's working with the quantized version, as in zero one bit quantized version, you make a slicing. It's called a hard receiver. Okay. So we'll look at both situations. We, in, when we do coding, we might want to sometime process the soft values directly, either the LLR or the received value R itself, or we might want to process the hard decision values. Okay. So we'll do both. Okay. So this is uh, this is the model we'll be dealing. With. Okay. So like I said, if you have other complicated parts, you deal with them in whatever way you want to get to this model. Then we'll do coding with this model. Okay. So that's the situation. Okay, so when you don't do any coding, each symbol is sent independently one at a time and you can decode each received value. There's nothing better you can do, right? If one symbol is independent from the other symbol, there's nothing you can do. So what you do in coding is you introduce some dependence between symbols that you are transmitting. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind coding. When you do coding, you add controlled redundancy. Okay, so I'm saying redundancy because it's redundant. You're repeating something. Okay, so well, you'll you'll repeat it very smartly. So it's controlled in a certain way. Okay, so you don't necessarily do a repeating. Okay, so if you do coding, okay, if you do coding, okay, so first thing I want to show is an uncoded system. So once again, from the same picture as before. Okay, so you have a bit. Uh, B of K going to a symbol S of K noise gets added to it N of K you get RK so at RK if I want to define SNR and EB over N naught we know how to do that okay so SNR is going to be what okay symbol energy is 1 right in BPSK noise energy is sigma square okay so if you want to do EB over N naught what will happen there will be a factor of 2 that enters from somewhere, right? Because n naught is 2 sigma square. So, you will get what? You should get 1 by 2 sigma square. Am I right? Okay. So, these are the definitions. So, in this model, you know exactly how to compute SNR and EB over n naught. Okay. And remember, this SNR and EB over n naught has a practical relevance in the in a real system also. Okay. Maybe not in absolute terms, but in relative terms, it definitely has a real meaning, right? So when we convert from symbols to waveforms, we keep track of that. We make sure the energy is the same, right? And the sigma square can be also obtained from the noise spectrum at the receiver. So all these things are very realistic numbers, okay? But from a model point of view, I'm pointing out what this is, okay? So usually this is converted to dB. When you convert to dB, what do you do? 10 times log 10, okay? So that's a very standard thing, okay? So, so if you notice, this thing which is actually ES, energy in the symbol was equal to EB which is energy per information bit, okay, because every symbol carries one information. So this is the no coding picture, okay, so this is no coding, 
and when you do this you know exactly what the trade off between probability of error and eb over n not is what is the trade off probability of error is going to be q of 1 by sigma which is square root of 2 eb over n not okay and you can plot this and you will get the previous plot i said had, uh, i showed you okay there's nothing better you can do okay so the idea of coding is to not send one bit at a time independently but to collect a bunch of bits add some control redundancy and then send all the symbols together okay and then look at all the received values together and try to do collective decoding now you can't just slice independently you have to do collective decoding okay so that's the idea and this is how the picture looks okay so i'm going to change a few things here so i take a vector b say which is k bits and then first do something called encoding to get a vector c which is say n bits okay so usually you pick a rate k by n which will be less than 1 okay so because you are repeating it okay so the k bits get converted into n bits okay so one way to think of it is c will be composed of two parts b followed by a vector p b will be the same k bits and then p will be additional n minus k parity bits that you added okay so this is how coding is done in most cases in practice okay so there are very few cases where you don't do this in fact actually there are cases where you don't do this also okay so so in fact there's no need for for you to repeat b it can be any set of n bits okay so this c is said to be a code word okay so this this is called the message this is a code word okay so the message b belongs to okay so i have not used this notation before what is this notation 0 1 raised power k what is that okay set of all k tuples binary k tuples so any k bit vector okay c actually belongs to 0 1 par n see notice the message can be any one of 2 par k possibilities but the code word since you are doing a definite mapping will be only what the list of all code words will be a subset of 0 1 n okay so this is the code word this is there and the code is the set of all code words it will be a subset of 0 1 n okay so what does the encoder do now encoder does a one to one mapping between yeah the message from the message space to the code space the code okay so that's what that's what the encoder does and typically the mapping is done this way all right so k is less than uh, less than or equal to 1 uh, less than or equal to n and that's a reasonable choice in most cases okay so this is encoding once you do encoding the rest of the model does not change okay so next you do mapping 0 to plus 1 1 to minus 1 okay so if your code word bit is 0 you send plus 1 the same bpsk mapping as before if the code word bit is 1 you send minus 1 there's no change there and noise gets added to it you can't control this okay so there's too many k's here so I'll simply write noise okay noise gets added to it normal mean zero variance sigma square and then you get a received vector r okay so this r is going to be r1 r2 so on till rn right r will be what some some real real vector okay n n tuple real numbers okay so the first question i want to ask before we look at how to do any decoding or anything like that is to define a suitable eb over n not for the coded situation okay we have to, have to carefully do it why exactly the information is one bit of information is not carried by each symbol less than one bit of information is carried in each symbol how many bits of information is carried in each symbol k by n okay so it's like everybody knows the answer okay so eb will become what now
n by k right so eb will become n by k okay so you notice in the previous case eb was equal to 1 here it's become n by k it has artificially gone up because i'm sending lesser information in one thing okay so eb over n naught will be what n by k 2 sigma squared okay another way of doing that this rate is typically denoted r so 1 by 2 r sigma square is a typical computation for eb over n naught okay so if you are doing coding at a certain rate r say half or one third or two thirds or 0.9 or whatever number that is then your eb over n naught definition changes compared to the uncoded situation so if i did a computation for probability of error with a certain eb over n naught here at the same eb over n naught i will have a different value of what sigma in my simulation model okay so if this is a kind of a loose simulation model or the way you're thinking about it at the same eb over n naught the sigma for the coded situation will in general be will be larger right so that's the right way of comparing the coded and the uncoded system so this is a very fair comparison between coded and uncoded systems okay if you have a certain eb over n naught in the uncoded case each symbol is carrying more information so i use a certain sigma if i now do rate half coding at the same eb over n naught i have to use a larger sigma to 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 make a fair comparison okay so when coding gives you coding gain it has to work against a larger noise uh, larger noise that's being added so in spite of that coding gives you a huge gain okay so that's the way to think about it okay so in practice there's another way of thinking about how this noise enhancement comes about okay suppose you have you have to send k bits and you're using a certain clock okay certain clock rate and you have to send it within one second so you use a certain clock clock rate now within that one second you have to send n bits which means your clock rate would have increased by n by k so why will the noise increase you're using a larger bandwidth right obviously if your clock rate is increasing by n by k you're using a larger bandwidth so in a receiver you'll have to filter a larger bandwidth which means what you're letting in more noise and the noise variance is increased okay so that's one way of thinking about it any other way you deal with to make a fair comparison between coding and uncoding you have to pay this penalty in eb or under Okay, you cannot do it without it. makes total sense okay so that's the thing i described of increasing the clock rate is one very practical way of doing it in most systems that's how they do it they would keep a certain uncoded rate and then they would introduce a coding block and increase their clock rate use more frequency let in more noise and deal with that okay in spite of that coding gives you gain in eb over n naught with this type of eb over n naught calculation coding can give you enormous gain okay so that's the way to understand it in a digital communication system Okay, so beginning with next week, we'll start with some very simple coding schemes which don't really give you coding in. Okay, but just to understand the decoding better. Okay, we'll do that first and then we'll slowly move on to convolutional codes which give you a lot of coding in.